Good morning, ladies. I hope this finds you well. Um, I have waited to do this video because I wanted to be clear with God on my own conscience and his word and everything else. Um, so I just want to share some things with you that God's been teaching me this year. Um, when the shutdowns first began, and I will tell you my conviction is that we will face another one soon. Um, I was uneasy, uneasy about not gathering, uneasy about the masks as that whole thing came in, um, just uneasy in general and seeking God's understanding of how to view these things, how to deal with them, how to meet them. And at first, <clears throat> at first I was kind of, uh, following the, uh, instruction to, uh, to follow our government until it contravenes God's law. But I also saw the deception in so much of what was going on. And as for, for where I am, we started shut down early in March and we went into the first week of June. As we came to the end of that shutdown time and we were allowed to gather again, we were blessed at my church because it's a small church. So uh, by splitting into two services, we were able to have our whole congregation welcome to return and stay beneath the numbers that our governor had set. Um, and then on top of that, some people don't feel comfortable to gather back together so that the services were a little smaller than usual. <clears throat> what God brought me to as we moved into that phase, masks were made a requirement a few weeks later. Um, and I don't believe there is either scientific or spiritual reason to wear a mask, frankly, but as I got, uh, I don't even know what the right word is. I like a good fight. <laughs> That's the truth. Uh, I've always enjoyed debate. I've always enjoyed pitting myself against uh, someone else, especially uh, on an intellectual level, I like the challenge and I will go to bat when I believe in something. And when the masks came in and at first were a guideline, not a requirement, I just simply didn't wear one. Um, and I was happy to have the conversation gently and I, would, I had no plans to get aggressive. I wasn't posting on social media about it. But if anybody came to me and asked me, I'd be very upfront with them about what I believed and why I was comfortable that I was safe in God's hands. Um, and that I also believe that there was deception in the system. But then our government, our state government, made masks mandatory. First, uh, when you were inside a business and now anytime in any place that you will be within six feet of people. And many people I know are standing in protest to that and simply not wearing them. And I had initially planned to, again, gently take that position, just not wear them. And then we had our first church service after this guideline was put in place, this requirement. And in order to be uh, not wanting to cause my brother to stumble. We have a, a high population in my church of senior citizens, and many of them have very serious health uh, issues. And so in order to be uh, kind to any of them that might feel uncomfortable, as a staff person at the church, I wore a mask while people were coming in and out, milling around, and I might be in, in touch with people. I wore a face shield and I was happy to do it because I didn't want my brothers and sisters to feel uncomfortable. I didn't want to be a distraction to them. I thought the, the most of them to be fair, weren't wearing them, but there were a few here and there. And I thought for those people, I don't want them to feel 
uncomfortable coming back. And as I was leaving church that day, God said to me, why would you extend that grace to your brothers and sisters and not to people in the world who don't have me? And it just kind of flipped my whole perspective. And over the course of the next few days, I started thinking about that and realizing that I had gotten caught up in the deception. I see the deception in what's going on. And I thought it was important to uh, resist that deception or to not feed into it. I thought that by wearing a mask out, I would be feeding into it. But the Lord let me see that I can't speak into people's lives. I can't have uh, meaningful interactions with people who aren't free unless I'm putting them in a position of comfort. Wearing a mask in and of itself does not contravene God's law. Do I think it's pointless? Yes. Do I think it's fear-mongering? Yes. Do I think that there's scientific reason to do it? No. But is there a reason to do it to keep others in a place that's less afraid? Yes. And so every time now that I go into public in my state, I wear one. Um, and I'm just telling you that story because it was a process of many months for God to kind of open my eyes to take that position. So the other question in that shutdown time was the gathering. Should we obey the government when the government tells us not to gather? Now, do I see, once again, the deception in that? Yes, of course I do. Do I see the danger and the precedent it sets? Absolutely. But I will tell you right from the beginning, uh, it was very disturbing to me how many Americans in particular, but this was across the Western world, but it was very prominent in America, that uh, there was this belief and reliance on the law, the, the, the governing law, the Constitution, the legal system, state versus federal, all of this stuff. There was seem to be more faith placed in the systems of government than in God because this is a violation of our rights and we need to do this and we need to vote for that person and not for that person or we need to move this law or we need to sign that petition. And it really raised the hackles on my neck because if our first instinct when a difficulty is faced is to look for a legal route to solve it, that shows where our faith is. So I was uncomfortable with being told not to gather, but I didn't have the conviction to stand in rebellion to it yet, but I was asking God how I should view that and how to understand it. And I'll be honest with you, throughout the shutdown, I became more and more uncomfortable with not gathering as a church, but also less able to identify how, <laughs> how it should be done whether it should be, you know, what's effectively a protest or rebellion or not and this kind of thing. So then we were able to gather again and I was able to relax. Well, come a few weeks ago, the Holy Spirit's conviction is on me, watching the world, listening to everything that's going on, and just listening to God 
that we have another shutdown coming. Um, I don't know when it will be, but I know that it's coming and we're going to have to face these questions again. And so it became very urgent for me to understand, Lord, should we or should we not just straight up tell the government no? And when the issue of John MacArthur's church, a grace community, which I used to be a member of, um, I worshiped there for two years and well, on and off for two years. And I attended the master's college, which is John MacArthur's uh, liberal arts college, not the seminary. Um, and I don't, I'll, I'll just, I don't hold to many of the doctrines that the Grace Community Church holds to. I see some legalism there and I see some, some other issues, but at the same time, the people that I knew and John MacArthur himself, who I had opportunity to have a, a, a small relationship with, um, there is no doubt God is in his life and he, uh, he chooses God and wants to honor God. I have no question about that. Um, but I don't agree with some of the, what I would call man-made doctrine, that that entire circle and, and denomination of the church holds to. But they weren't, these are still my friends. I have people that are still in ministry down there. I have people that are still in those circles that are still connected to Grace Community or the offshoot churches that have come from it. Um, this is still a part of my life. These people are still part of my life. So it felt very personal to read those stories, even though it's not my sphere. And I reached out to a friend who uh, attends a church very closely linked to Grace Community, and the leaders of it come from John MacArthur's uh, seminary and church. And I asked him what he thought and what he knew because you can't trust the press, right? So I went to my friend and I said, do you know what's really going on? Do you have a view on it? You know, can you give me any insight basically? And he's a very discerning man. And so I trusted his judgment just to give me thoughts on the whole, the whole situation, be it about Grace Community or not. And he said something so insightful and so perfect, and I knew it was from God. He said that their church had, from day one, not taken the position that Grace Community had taken. And their position was, if you have to gather on a Sunday in order to be gathering in fellowship, if that's the only time of the week that you are gathering in fellowship, there's a bigger problem and going to Sunday church isn't going to solve it. And it was like the heavens opened and I just went, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is so true. I have my whole life had an uneasiness in my spirit about the Western view of church. Not that I think it's wrong, not that I think we shouldn't do it, but that it doesn't actually reflect church in the New Testament sense. Because church in the New Testament sense is the people, not the building, not the name, not a denomination, not anything. It's just the people who know Christ. And in the gathering of that, the example that we see is people who are in each other's lives coming together whenever to worship, to teach, to sing, to rebuke. The example that we have is not a one or two hour session once a week with you know, three songs at the beginning, announcements, a sermon, communion, and another song at the end. That is not the framework, so to speak, that God gave us. The framework that he gave us was just being together, fellowshipping together, talking about him, teaching about him, learning about him. 
being in each other's lives so that we can see each other's sin, address it where it's needed, receive address where it's needed, be in life together. And I realized that for me, and, and I, had, I had fought this attitude from people for many years, I have never seen Sunday church as the center of my faith. I never have. Not since I was transformed by God. Not since my faith grew into, my relationship with God grew into something really tangible and vital for me. I've never seen Sunday church as the lifeline for that. For me, the lifeline for that has always been my daily time one-on-one -on -one with God. And then the times that I get together with friends or groups or smaller groups where we are intentionally focused on God, just talking about him, talking about our lives, talking about what's good, what's bad, looking into God's word to find the answers for it. Now, sometimes that is organized. Sometimes that is a weekly meeting at a specific time with specific people. Other times it's just three or four friends getting together and we start talking. But I realized that that was why when my friend said this, it, it just clarified everything for me. It lifted the fog. Gathering in a biblical sense simply means coming together with other people who know God intentionally to speak about, learn about, and grow in relationship with him together. It does not have to be one or two or 500 people under a pastor. It does not have to be an organized worship team. Worship, do you know, doesn't even have to have music. You worship God anytime you lift up the goodness of him and you acknowledge it and you speak it to him and you speak it to others. That is worship. And yes, we should sing. We're told to sing. My point is that gathering doesn't have to occur in a sanctuary on a Sunday morning. We need to cut loose, I think, of our Western trappings of church. We need to stop seeing anything man-made as being the vehicle for God. Yes, he uses it. Don't get me wrong. I love my church. I love my church. I don't want to go worship anywhere else. But I also realize that if we get shut down again, that's not going to stop me gathering. Sure, I might not be gathering with 100 or 200 people uh, on a Sunday morning. I might be gathering Wednesday afternoon with four people. But if we're gathering, it's okay. We don't have to fear the loss of Sunday church. Now, is the loss of Sunday church a glaring example of where this world is going? Yes, and I agree with you, and that's one of the reasons that we're going to be studying the prophecies this year, because it's very clear that we're on that trajectory. We are, we are moving toward genuine persecution of the church in America, in all of Western culture, but we're not there yet. Let's be really clear. We are not being killed for our faith. We might be demeaned. We might be, we might receive hostility. We might be unjustly treated. We are not losing our faith. We, excuse me, we're not losing our lives for our faith. And there are many, many places in this world where people are. So we need to not marginalize, I believe, the people that are literally enduring genuine persecution and suggest that what we're facing right now is the same. Is it on the persecution scale? Sure. It's the first step. We're moving in that direction. No doubt about it. And I think if you wait 10 years, you probably will start to see genuine persecution in Western culture of Christians, because that has to happen. It's unavoidable. The prophecies are very clear. This is why I say it's so 
important not to have our faith in state, in government, in the legal system. They are not God. They are not the vehicle by which we are justified. They are not the vehicle by which we find strength and grace and peace. They, I'll be really honest with you. I cannot see anywhere in scripture that we are told or shown to actively seek out legal or justification or, or government processes to solve a spiritual problem. In fact, the opposite is true. We're specifically told not to. Now, everyone raises the issue of Paul addressing his Roman citizenship and using that to, uh, to save lives. But the thing that I'll point you to in that passage is that Paul never went out seeking to, uh, to address these issues in the legal system or through the governors. It was forced upon him. He was already in prison. He was already being arrested those times when he used the legal systems to his advantage, he didn't go looking for it. He didn't pick the fight. He just used their own systems against them when he could, and they are rare. Most of the persecution and martyrdom that occurs in the New Testament, they never address things legally, not, not from, our, from our Western sense. They are unjustly accused, unjustly punished, unjustly imprisoned or killed. This will happen in this country. It's going to take some time, but that's where we're going. Don't see our government as your ticket out of persecution. The Bible is very clear, very clear that persecution is coming. Real persecution imprisonment and martyrdom is coming in the lives of the church in this country before Jesus returns. Unavoidable. My advice, my best advice, is to recognize now that our relationships with Christ, with Jesus, with God himself, with the Holy Spirit, that relationship is our lifeline no matter what is happening politically, socially, economically. If we are unable now to reach out and find intimacy with God and find strength and peace and comfort through him, how will we ever do it in the midst of a culture that is coming against us. 10 years from now, when America starts imprisoning Christians, is too late to find that lifeline. Find it now, while you have time, while you have freedom, while you can still invite Christians into your home, while you can still be invited into theirs. Use the freedom you have now to grow and mature and strengthen so that when these other things come, you already have the resources available to you. You're already well rooted in Christ. You're already able to draw from him what you need. Because if you don't, it's going to be a sharp and difficult and dangerous slide into God's arms. I can't tell you in any clearer sense. I can't see the biblical substantiation in the New Testament, which is the new covenant, which is the post-resurrection covenant with God. I cannot see any established principle, instruction, or example that Christians should be pursuing legal means to 
hold on to their rights. What do your rights as an American citizen mean in eternity? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. They will not be part of the picture at all. So whatever you do now, consider that if your energy and your time and your attention and your mental space is all taken up in fighting for temporary, physical, tangible rights that the Lord himself tells you in his word will be removed from you. If that's where all your energy and attention is going and that is the example that you are setting in the world for someone who follows God, what are you telling them about him? If you really think the legal system, the government system, the justice system is where your time, attention, and energy should be going. What do people who don't know God learn from that? What does that say where you will be left when those things are no longer open to you? Because prophecy makes it very clear those rights, those rights, they're not going to stick around. We need to have our time and energy and attention in growing with God ourselves and then being able to share and comfort others with the good news and comfort we've been given. I know that if all of my attention and energy goes into knowing God better and sharing him with others, when I stand before God, I will not have regret. But I fear that many, many Christians are so driven into the political system and so driven into the legal system right now that when they stand before God, they are going to weep, not because they won't reach heaven, but because they'll finally see the futility of what they were doing. And they'll realize that the enemy used that to keep them distracted and engaged so that they weren't drawing people to Jesus. Ask yourself, if you could spend an hour today being an activist for the rights of the church or sharing Christ with a single person, which do you think God would have you do?